workers on Turkish farms and Europe, Seth among farm workers from Mexico on US farms, yet their, their research speaks to uh, each other. And that's one reason to bring Denise Dury and Seth Holmes together in this webinar. Among others, their work shows, I believe, how political economy is also identity politics, how migrant workers are represented as a lesser kind, a less than human, based on their perceived natural characteristics and their depiction as backward and dirty. It's time to listen to what Seth and Denise have prepared for us. The first lecture is by Denise, directly followed by Seth. And after their lectures, we have ample time for a Q&A and a critical dialogue. Denise, uh, the word is uh, yours. Thank you for this gener generous introduction. And thank you um, for Mark and Lizette and you. Uh, for this opportunity to present, and I'm grateful to have a have this chance to uh, have a conversation with Seth. Uh, he has been an um, an influence on my work. So, and I would like to thank everyone in our audience um, for being here despite the Zoom fatigue that inevitably crept in on a lot of us um, in the month of May. Today, I want to test out a few ideas with you and receive your feedback, since this talk is a combination of two articles that I'm going to be working on in the coming months. Let me first share my screen. These two articles, both of them are related to the processes of race making and the formation of uh, Kurdish political subject subjectivities as they are experienced by Kurdish farm workers in Western Turkey, as the title of my talk indicates. So I'll give you a brief outline of my talk. I will, um, in this talk, I will briefly talk about the history of the military occupation and the resulting dispossession in Kurdistan which made at least one and a half million people dependent on migrant labor in Western Turkey. I will introduce this mig migrant labor practice and who these workers are. Then I will uh, outline how I conducted fieldwork for 20 months between 2008 and 2016. After doing this groundwork, I will move on to what, I'm, what I mean by race making and political subjectivity and why political violence is a key aspect of both of these processes. Finally, I will illustrate with two accounts um, by two Kurdish labor intermediaries um, who solved problems caused by politicized and racialized tens tensions. So let's begin. I apologize for those of you who are very familiar with the uh, Kurdish predicament, but I wanted to um, give a brief, brief outline for those for the general audience who are not familiar. Kurds are one of the uh, largest stateless nations in the world. And they live across four countries, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, and in the diaspora. These numbers that um, I took from the KurdishProject.org are, um, are belong to 2014. So the Kurdish population is probably higher right now. Today, I will be talking about the Kurdish region of Turkey, this area, um, Northern Kurdistan or Bakur in Kurdish. And I will refer to it um, as Kurdistan. Kurdistan is tortured with centuries of long violence and occupation to such a degree that it's very hard to represent life in the region without first talking about conflict. Kurds are around, uh, form around 18% of Turkey's population and the vast majority lives in this area and in, in the uh, metropolis, metropoles of Western Turkey. Throughout the history of the Republic, consecutive governments have always tried to prevent the formation of any form of self-rule in, in Kurdistan and the economic base that could for, uh, support political autonomy. So the region, as you can see from uh, the specific years that I cited as Ilkar Jurek writes, quote, the target of overwhelmingly violent policies through extra for, extraordinary forms of flu, rule. These are the specific years of emergency uh, rule. And as you can see, um, 
until 2002, it is almost constantly under one, of, one form of emergency rule or another. Kurds or, organized numerous revolts against these policies and the violent and oppressive governments. At other times, they chose to remain quiet or formed strategic alliances with Turkish governments, but they have always been active in determining the fate of their lands. The PKK or Kurdistan Workers Party has defined itself as the 29th of these Kurdish revolts against the Turkish state. It is a Kurdish guerrilla organization in a, and it has been at war with uh, the Turkish state since 1984, which the Turkish state labels as a terrorist organization. In the 1990s, the main domain of armed conflict was the rural areas. The Turkish security forces burned and evac evacuated villages and hamlets that they presumed to be aiding the PKK guerrillas. They killed and wounded tens of thousands of civilians, arrested and tortured thousands, and forcibly displaced millions of Kurdish people, which used uh, younger than um, work talks about. Many villagers who were displaced from their villages resettled in the nearest town centers and cities of Kurdistan. So these towns and cities grew exponentially in the 1990s. The unemployment rates in these towns and cities were already high due to decades of military occupation, systematic dispossession, and de facto economic blockade of the region. People who could no longer make a living in Kurdistan started working for, uh, looking for other means of subsistence in Western Turkey, and migrant farm work was one of them. Derek uh, is one of the towns, um, and one of these towns, and it is my main fieldwork town, and 40% of its population depends on farm work in Western Turkey. Migrant workers from Kurdistan, I'm sorry. It is estimated that uh, about up to one and a half million workers from Kurd Kurdistan migrate and work in Western uh, farms for periods ranging from 40 days to nine months. They work in the fields, orchards, and greenhouses. Um, sorry, I'm trying to, yeah. Owned by Turkish farmers in Western Turkey. Most of them are Kurds, but there are also Arab and Turkmen families living in provincial towns with populations ranging from 20,000 to um, 250,000 in the working class neighborhood and in the working class neighborhoods uh, of large cities in Kurdistan. Since 2011, more and more Syrian refugees have joined this labor force, but still Kurdish workers compose the majority of this um, labor force, according to my estimates, because those statistics about migrant farm workers are really not reliable. So this is the area that I will be talking about as Kurdistan. And this is, these are the provinces in the Kurdish region where the workers come from. This, these are the lowlands of Kurdistan. I started the, this research by conducting interviews with Turkish farmers in 2008 in the cotton producing region of Suke and ethnographic research with Turkish, Roma, and Arab Kurdish worker families in the summers of 2009, 2012, and 2013 on the farms and orchards of Manisa and Giresun. My initial contacts were Turkish farmers who allowed me to work alongside their workers. Kurds were the largest group of migrant farm workers and they were racialized and criminalized as potential terrorists and were subject to multiple surveillance practices by their employers and by the military police. The three decade long war between the PKK guerrillas and the Turkish state had not only caused dispossession and the pro proletarianization of the peoples of Kurdistan, but also stood at the heart of the racialized and military, militarized mechanisms organizing this labor practice. Therefore, I realized that I had to um, start in Kurdistan and come to the farms as a friend of the Kurdish workers for my PhD research. 
I started the longest continuous phase of my field work in Kurdistan in November 2014 by setting, settling in Derik, Mardin, a Kurdish provincial town where almost half the population are migrant farm workers. I spent seven months with Kurdish workers and labor intermediaries in their homes and joined the daily and social and political life of the town. This is Derek. Um, and this is a wedding. I participated in a lot of weddings. I learned some govend. I can't say I'm um, very good at it. This is another wedding at the town square. And I went to engagement ceremonies, birthday parties. This is the Nerose of 2015, actually one of the most hopeful moments uh, um, in the history of Kurdistan. The elections were approaching, the historic 2015 elections, in which the pro-Kurdish party looked to be one of the strongest, um, the strongest that it, it has been in the history of the Republic. I attended um, many funerals as well. This is one of them. Um, I learned how to bake bread and I drank a lot of um, tea, black tea, kachak tea, obviously. In the fall of 2015, no, sorry, in, in the spring, in the spring I went to work with um, migrant farm workers on the farms of Western Turkey as a farm worker and other rural work sites such as charcoal making and greenhouses in Manisa, Izmir, Bursa, Adapazarı, Ankara, Çorum, Yoz and Yozgat in Western Turkey in the summers of um, 2015 and 2016. In the fall of 20, I'm sorry. So these are the tents that um, migrant farm workers stay in. The ice, as you can see, there's a quite a difference between the, uh, the upper pictures and the lower ones. I stayed in all forms of these tents. This is a family of six workers. I would say six and a half with me. These are with Kurdish workers from Dedik and Syrian Kurdish workers that I met during uh, doing research from with Kurdish workers from Derek. In the fall of 2015, I went back to Kurdistan and spent three months in Diyarbakir, Derek, um, and Jaylampnar at the um, in Urfa at the border, and Antalya, visiting the Arab, Kurdish, Syrian, and Syrian workers I met with working on the farms um, the pre previous summer. In the summer of 2015, the two year long ceasefire and peace negotiations between the Turkish state and the PKK ended for good and a new form of warfare called the urban wars emerged. Thus, during, for, during my field work, I witnessed both the most hopeful moments of the peace process and the onset of one of the most bloodiest or, or, or the um, bloodiest periods of armed conflict in Kurdistan and observed how political violence affected the lives of Kurdish migrant workers, both in Kurdistan and in Western Turkey. Let me now move on to what I call race making and political subjectivity. The racialization of Kurds is rather prevalent in daily life, not only in the cities of Western Turkey, but also in rural contexts where Turkish farmers and their employees, Kurdish migrant farm workers, experienced significant social tensions. At first sight, the question of racialization might look like it was operating through a binary. It is not only that the Turks are the owners of those farms, um, the majority in Western Turkey and the dominant ethno-racial group in Turkey and the locals of the region, as opposed to the Kurds who are workers away from the region where they are the majority and the subordinate ethno-racial group, especially in relation in relationship to the Turkish state. In this case, it looks like racialization operates not only through a binary, but through ethno-racial domination mapped onto class conflict. But you might say, how is this different than any other migrant labor practice, let's say 
from Mexican workers in California. The key to that answer is in this phrase, the relationship um, to the Turkish state. In fact, in the relationship, not only of the Kurdish workers, but also of the Kurdish farmers to the Turkish state. And the relationship of both groups to the Turkish state is intimately tied to the war in Kurdistan and political violence in all over Turkey. But as anthropologists, we tend to be suspicious when, see, when we see binaries and power mapping so neatly over people's lives, determining their actions or their complex social words worlds. Throughout my re research, I was reminded over and over again how neither race, which we assume creates domination and subordination, nor class, which I, like many socialists, would like to think has a binary structure of the owners of the means of production and those who have nothing but their labor power to sell, operate neatly through this binary structure. So I don't think um, it holds. In fact, as I will later argue, it is the war and the political violence that seems to hold this binary in place. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and continue. Ex let me continue explaining what I mean by race making and subjectivity. It is no easy task to define racialization and race and distinguish them from ethnicization or ethnicity. Hence, many scholars have used race and ethnicity interchangeably resorted to the composite term ethnoracial, written one or both in inverted commas, or argued that ethnicity, race, or racialization should be abandoned for their lack of specificity. And since they include the analyses of more complicated singular and singular social, political, and economic processes. Whether one chooses to employ race, ethnicity, ethnicization, or racialization, one common emphasis is that these are not empirical realities to be found in the world, but social processes of boundary making. Still, both in the academic and lay uses of the terms, ethnicity and race signal culture and biology respectively. However, this distinction is an uneasy one too, since whatever is defined as biology or the body is already determined socioculturally. As Omi and Winant argue, although the concept of race appeals to biologically based human characteristics, the so-called phenotypes, the selection of these particular human features for purposes of racial signification is always necessarily a historical and um, social and historical process, end of quote. Miles and Brown define racialization as, quote, where biological and or somatic features, um, in parentheses, real or imagined, are signified, we speak of racialization as a specific modality of ethnicization. What I found problematic, what I find problematic about this definition, although it's very close to what I use, is when is the body not ever not involved in the making of ethnic or racial difference. And when we posit racialization as a process, do we not imply that race is a more stable category? But there's still a merit to this definition that I would like to salvage, namely the signification or of the real or imagined biological and or somatic features. Included in these features, according to the way I think about race making, um, are not only visible and audible clues that might sign, signify the other's difference or sameness, but also racialized affects that people might feel, sense, react to, and express, such as fear, aversion, disgust, disgust hatred, or pity in the presence of the other, or joy, ease, safety, and assurance in, the, in one's self-reflection and self fashioning and the, uh, the, it also works the other way around with the other and the self. Um, affect situates this real or imagined somatization of difference within the broader political and economic context by working through class and gender forms of subjectivation. Um, I have other parts of um, 
this um, work where I talk about gender, but in this one, I, it's not a um, it's not a focus. As Berg and Ramos Zayas argue, the consequences of both affective manifestations, self-fashioning, and affective being, self-reflection, carries significantly different political economic uh, consequences for racialized populations, end of quote. Race making is a collective embodied and affective experience of paramount Im importance to the formation of Kurdish working class subjectivities. Approaching race from the point of embodiment and affect allows me to look beyond ethno-racial groups as given collectivities that share linguistic, cultural, or biological characteristics. Instead, it helps us see race, race and racialization as social processes that form individual and collective subject, subjects by signifying, experiencing, and resignifying difference and sameness. More concretely in this perspective, being Kurdish or Turkish is not a singular identity shared by a predetermined group of people. Instead, subjects become Kurdish or Turkish as an affective and um, as a result of the affective and embodied experience that forms the self through imaginary and real encounters with the other. Throughout the histories of the Ottoman Empire and the Turkish Republic, Racial imaginaries, discourses, and moral and affective tropes have been mobilized in many instances to define Kurds, enabling the Turkish state to implement its policies ranging from assimilation to genocide. The Orientalist and colonial racial discourses on Kurds have always drawn in elements like the metaphors of animality, savagery, primitiveness, and monstrosity, and included details like skin color, body hair, and even a widespread belief that Kurds had tails. Three decades of war between the PKK and the Turkish state also added terrorists to this racializing vocabulary. Throughout my fieldwork, many Turkish farmers, supervisors, and locals have told me there was a cultural difference between, quote, local workers and, which means, Turkish workers, and those from the East, which is a euphemism used for Kurdish. They said the ones from Western provinces were, quote, better in terms of culture, end of quote. Quote, those from the East do not understand a thing. And, quote, these, they're, they are barbarians, end of quote. Several people described to me how they have sex, how they defecate, and how they smell, all of which are intimate bo bodily details that these Turkish people had observed to the minute, minutest detail with fascination and aversion at the same time, and would, would avoid talking about in public except when it was about racialized populations. In addition to this racializing language, there were also always inferences, silences, omissions, gestures, imaginaries, and affects felt in their presence. And more often than not, the conversation would include an implicit or explicit, explicit reference to terrorism. Once Janar, a farmer from Manisa told me, when these ones first came here, they were like animals. They did not even understand a halt or a hope. Then they slowly developed a little, but anyway, they support the PKK, even if you chop their arms off. Actually, that's why the, that region is backward. One reason is the terrorism and the other is the sheikhs. I observe these ones. They do whatever the sheikh says. I heard this um, in 20, uh, 2009, and I have been in touch with um, this group of workers ever since then, and I assure you there's no shape in the picture. And But that's one of those racializing tropes that come in handy um, and piggyback on terrorism whenever um, the reason for backwardness or so-called backwardness um, is trying to be explained by um, farmers or Turkish people of the region. And it would mostly lead to conversations of endorsement of the involvement of the security forces uh, towards Kurdish workers and their um, 
they're seeing them as potential workers. Like when a cotton farmer, Hussein, told me, the military police, gendarme, unavoidably monitors the arrival of workers. Of course, the state is right. One doesn't know whether the worker that, workers that come from the East are terrorists or what. But how can tur Turkish farmers think that their workers may be terrorists and still sustain a work relationship with, with their workers, live in the same village, sometimes uh, house them in a part of their homes like a shack or a garage and live side by side with them for over months? The key to this, the answer of this question and many other questions on uh, how to make this labor practice fraught with so much racial and political tension work is the institution of the Kurdish labor intermediary. Most labor intermediaries are middle-aged men from Kurdistan, although there are a few women intermediaries as well, with several children determining their um, place in society as responsible adults. Many are the younger brothers or sons of former intermediaries who took over their business partially for a certain region or entirely, and former workers who became intermediaries because they had the management and pe people skills that the job requires. All of them started out as workers and worked in the fields and orchards at least a couple of years before they became, became intermediaries so that they learned the tricks of the trade before they start managing worker-employer relationships. Many small and medium intermediaries bring their own families. And since there is no, there are no statistics, I will rely on my experience here. I, I would say small intermediaries would be those who um, bring up to 50 workers to a region and middle, like middle-sized intermediaries would be those who bring up to 300 um, workers. And they bring out their own family members and recruit others through immediate kinship, neighborly and place-based based relations. But there are also large intermediaries who work with up to 5,000 workers every summer. And they would be employing labor captains and supervisors. The official job of the labor intermediary is to find workers continuous and uninterrupted work and accommodation to keep the records and, the, and to collect the payments at the end of the season since uh, workers from Kurdistan do not get, until the end, get paid until the end of the season. In return for their services, labor intermediaries charge the workers 10% of their wages while not charging the employers. Although the nominal duties of a labor intermediary are limited to these tasks, labor intermediary's job has crucial and unofficial performative, affective, and organizational components as well. And one of them is to protect the workers from the military police. The racialization of Kurds as potential terrorists involves the Turkish state not only discursively, but quite materially through the direct and indirect involvement of the military police and the organization, monitoring and regulation of this so-called informal migrant labor practice. When workers from Kurdistan arrive at the towns where they, were, they will work, the labor intermediary meets with them and takes them to the specific locations where they will stay and work. As soon as the workers settle, the labor intermediary collects the, their ID cards and either takes them to the local um, branch of the military police himself or gives them to the employer or the village headman to register the workers at the military police station. Labor intermediaries also try to minimize encounters of workers with villagers by shopping for the essential needs of the workers, restricting the, um, the workers' movements to the tent camp area in times of political upheaval, and advising their workers not to discuss politics with Turkish people. However, neither the labor intermediaries' arrangements nor the workers' self-restraint can prevent all contact among the workers, employers, and locals and in the event of the conflict, the military police is immediately called to the scene. I realize I did not mention this, but um, the, mil 
military police is in charge of um, the rural areas in Turkey, and that's why it's not the regular police, but the military police. And also it's the same military that, of course, like attacks the homes and the the homelands of, in, of these workers in Kurdistan. I will end this talk with two accounts of how two Kurdish labor intermediaries with opposite political affiliations managed the racialized and politicized encounters with Turkish farmers and with the military police. For these to make sense, I will first say a few words about the Kurdish language and its place in the racialization of Kurds. Kurdish language, which um, by which I mean all dialects of uh, Kermanchi is a, uh, and Zazaki mostly spoken among the workers that I met. Whether spoken or silenced is an essential element both in the self-making of Kurds and in their marginalization by others. Thus it becomes one of the most prominent markers through which the racialization of Kurds operate. The, this is a direct consequence of Kurdish having been officially banned from being used in public and its um, criminalization as separatism for decades. Although there's no longer a legal ban against the public usage of Kurdish language, it is both criminalized legally and persecuted and stigmatized socially. Moreover, the affective charge of Turkish Kurdish language is imbued with political meaning since speaking Kurdish is perceived not only as a marker of ethno-racial difference, but also as an active resistance to assimilation. Um, this is perhaps this, I am speculating here. Um, this might have increased um, even more so when the more people learned uh, Turkish in the Kurdish region in Kurdistan. So um, monolingualism is not a, an issue um, in Turkey. In, in, in Turkey's Kurdistan and, um, anymore. Before the 2000s, it was, a it was commonplace for Turkish farmers to ban their Kurdish workers from speaking Kurdish on their farms. Sometimes Kurdish workers complied with these bans for fear of losing their jobs or being reported to the military police for being terrorists. In times of labor scarcity though, uh, Kurdish workers used their labor power as leverage to bargain for their right to speak in Kurdish. My first labor, interme my, my first labor intermediary account is by Amer, who told me the story of his role in such an act of resistance with his workers in a village in the Black Sea region. It was 1997 or 1998, there was a their labor scarcity. The owner of the orchard had problems with the previous group of workers and the workers fled, but we don't know uh, who those workers were. The regular daily wage were, was 4,000 liras, but with this group, we agreed on 4,500 liras daily. The workers loaded their belongings on his truck, which means the employer's truck. Um, they were on their way to the orchard the, and the farm, farm owner said, the previous workers were very bad. They used to talk in Kurdish among themselves. You don't talk in Kurdish, okay? There was a girl among those workers. She had spent a few years in prison, and which means um, due to Kurdish, pro-Kurdish political activity. Um, she was tough. She was like a man. She burst out and said, who are you to restrict my freedom? He stopped the car the he meaning the employer here stopped the car, car and turned back um, the workers called me and i said turn back i'll find you another job i can't concede to that why would i deny who i am for your work if we were to accept not talking in kurdish we would we would have done it at home in kurdistan then we would not be in need of the work you give us anyway and we would not have come here we did not deny who we were, at, who we are back at home, despite all that pressure. Why would we do that here? Then his uncle, he was the bigger boss, the village headman, um, Muftar, came to us and said, please don't leave, it will be as you wish. 
then we agree to go back to the orchard on the condition that this guy never speaks to the workers again. They said, okay, he won't go near the workers, so we went back. So Amer, complying with the ban of speaking Kurdish, was denying oneself, kendini in Karatmik in Turkish. Amer is from a village that the Turkish state tried to turn into village guards. Um, the paramilitia, um, the Turkish, the paramilitia organization, the Turkish state recruits among Kurdish villagers to fight against the PKK. But the village as a whole resisted the pressures and managed to strike a deal with the state and ne neither became village guards nor left their village. Omer argued that the reason why they needed the jobs in Western Turkey was that they did not deny who they were in Kurdistan. In other words, Omer signified his lower class position as a price he paid for the resistance, for his resistance to assimilation and to collaboration with the state. However, this position did not make him or his workers absolutely powerless. Using the labor power as leverage in a situation of labor shortage, Amar and his workers negotiated not only the terms of the, that labor agreement, but also the terms of their presence in that village as Kurds. Although in the 2010s, the stories of banning the workers speaking Kurdish and the military police interrogations were reduced significantly, those of equating Kurds with terrorism and the systematic support of the military for the Turkish inhabitants of the rural areas against Kurds continued. One of the topics that aggravated Turkish locals the most was their fear that the workers from Kurdistan would settle in those provinces and never leave. The second account of the labor intermediary I want to recount here is by labor intermediary Mehmet about how he handled the situation in which the Turkish villagers called the military police to remove the workers from their village. Mehmet is from a family in Kurdistan who have been state supporters for decades. And since Erdogan's Justice and Development Party, AKP, has been in power, they have been AKP supporters. He, store, he told the story as follows. There were four unoccupied buildings in the uh, village. We said it's hard to live in the tent with no water and electricity, at least when it rains, and this is a rainy region by the Black Sea, there should be a roof over their heads. When people settled in these buildings, the people of the village um, blamed the workers for being terrorists and called the military police. I said to the military police commander, if we were terrorists, why do we have these ID cards on us? Look at my ID, go ahead and run, run a background check on me. If there is a problem, I will leave. He said, no, the people of the village don't want you here. They, they don't want people from the east and the southeast. I said, give me five minutes. I left, I called my uncle, an AKP MP from Urfa. I told them they blame us for being terrorists. The military pol police is kicking us out of here. He um, told me, he, he said, tell me where you are exactly. Three minutes later, the commander came and apologized. The government, the district governor, um, the head of the police all came and apologized. I said, we are farm workers here. What does a terrorist, a brigand, a thief, excuse my language, a pimp have to do here? Mehmet was able to manage the situation because his uncle was a member of the parliament from the party in government. Later on, he told me that he was able to get a worker whose heart stopped beating while working in the field um, admitted to a private hospital with the help of his uncle too. Mehmet, like Amer, not only solved this problem, but also displayed an effective performance of, by standing up to the military police who was discriminating against Kurds and made him apologize. The workers particularly choose these labor intermediaries for additional uh, protection, which require, the or, uh, which require the organizational performative and affective labor and relational and material resources inaccessible to most workers. Mehmet's speech is full of cues of his state supporting political stance. He avoided the word, through, word Kurd throughout this conversation and replaced it with Easterner or Southeasterner, 
and he lists, listed terrorists alongside brigand, thief, and pimp. In the racialized political vocabulary on Kurds, Mehmet's silences, omissions, and associations told me that he had no problem with calling the supporters of the pro-Kurdish political movement terrorists and attempted to be on the, quote, um, good Kurd, end of quote, side of the colonial binary of good Kurds and bad Kurds, the yardstick of which is loyalty to the Turkish state. However, it does not get him or his workers out of being called terrorists simply because they are Kurds. It means that all Kurds, no matter their political stance, are burdened to prove their loyalty to the Turkish state over and over again. Mehmet, therefore, neg negotiated the terms of his presence of um, the terms of the presence of his workers in that village, not as Kurds as, as Amar did, um, but despite being Kurds. In conclusion, the racial profiling of Kurds is di directly implicated in the political and economic relations between Kurdistan and Turkey, like that of no other group. And racialization has created not only its own symbolic, imaginary, and affective repertoire, but also institutions like the intermediary. The institution of labor intermediary adopted its current form in response to the need to manage work relationship between Kurdish workers and Turkish farmers in the socially charged atmosphere of the legally deregulated workplace. The stories of the stories Amer and Mehmet told me were stories of their small victories. However, neither was Amer a champion of Kurdish rights all the time. He, in fact, told me that um, he generally does not go into politics with the um, Turkish farmers and advises um, his workers to do the same. Nor was Amer, uh, um, nor, nor were Mehmet's worker, workers less Kurdish for not ganging up against the employers and the military commander. They are all becoming Kurdish each time someone resembles them to an animal. Each time they say, who are you to restrict my freedom? Each time they see the military police and feel scared. And each season as they go back home and exchange stories with each other. However, race making is not only about marginalization and subordination or resistance and struggle, but also about the embodied self-making of Kurdish workers as race and class subjects. Kurdish migrant workers experience discrimination, subordination, and marginalization as Kurds, which they respond to by re-signifying their Kurdishness and distinguishing themselves from other racialized groups, such as Arabs or Syrians, and I'm using these terms because they're racialized as such, while at the same time contributing to, the, to those groups' racialization by reproducing the same racializing logics that subjugate themselves. They are not, as Nefertiti Tadiar warns us, quote, the proper protagonists of our critique, end of quote, but paying attention to the, their everyday struggles in navigating these power relations allows us to understand how anti-Kurdish politics and the Kurdish political movement are experienced beyond rigid, rigid ethnic identities, national politics, and universal ideologies and it allows us to see how unstable positions and ambiguous everyday situations form worker subjectivities beyond the neatly charted binaries of domination, exploitation, resistance, or submission. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Denise, for this uh, inspiring uh, talk, for showing also uh, uh, of sharing your experiences uh, during your uh, fieldwork and the way in which you brought together uh, general political developments with the lives of, uh, of, uh, of farm workers, Kurdish farm workers. We directly move to, uh, to Seth. So Seth, the, 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 the word is yours. After the talk of Seth, we will have the uh, Q&A. And Seth, you have to uh, unmute. Ah, you unmuted already. Please go ahead. 
Okay, great. Um, it's an honor to be here, even though we're all spatially and even temporally um, apart from one another, but it's good to be um, here at the University of Wageningen um, in rural sociology and with Denise um, to learn from you also, thinking we have a lot of our analysis is similar and I look forward to talking with you more afterwards about racialization, race making, embodied self making, political subjectivity and the different metaphors that are used to um, reinforce, justify, biologize, naturalize hierarchies and inequalities, but also the ways that people resist those and work against them. So thank you for your talk. Um, today, my idea is to um, use some of the field work that um, is from my book, Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies, Migrant Farm Workers in the United States, and follow up field work over the past several years, um, including ways I've been rethinking some of this work and a little bit in terms of um, where that is leading me in, in my next research projects. And after the talk, I look forward to conversations with all of you, including with Denise. Um, I have a few blank slides and it's not because there's a problem with technology. It's just because there's, as an anthropologist, I'm also um, trained to be a little suspicious of the ways that um, images can distract us. So there are a few times when I have a blank slide just to encourage us to focus on words. Um, as a physician, I'm trained to give a PowerPoint slideshow, which when I'm in the audience, I often find a little bit boring. As an anthropologist, I'm trained to read you a paper, literally, which when I'm in the audience, sometimes I find a little bit boring. So today I'm going to do both. Um, and because of the screen, when I'm looking up here, I'm actually looking at you, but the camera's in a different place. So sorry about that. There are two primary questions that animate all my different research projects. The first is, how do social structures and social hierarchies produce health, well-being, injury, and disease for different categories of people? And in the project I'll talk about today, specifically how are indigenous Mexican migrants positioned by categories of race, class, multi-layered citizenship throughout their transnational circuits and how does that positioning produce health, illness, and suffering? And second, how do social hierarchies and socially structured sickness and injury come to be understood as normal and natural both in society and in healthcare? And when are they confronted and resisted? Specifically in this project, how do representations in public culture as well as in clinical medicine serve to make invisible or legitimate the predicaments and illnesses of indigenous Mexican farm workers. So I'll start this talk by setting the ethnographic scene and mapping some of the social positions and spatiality in transnational agriculture. Um, and then I'll move into analyzing and theorizing those two questions. The National Agricultural Worker Survey in the United States indicates that 81% of farm employees are immigrants, 95% of whom were born in Mexico and over half of whom are undocumented. It's estimated that there are 1 million indigenous people from the Southern Mexican state of Oaxaca, primarily speaking Mixtec, Zapotec and Triqui languages. Transnational migration is in many ways particularly compelling in the world right now, um, as many states in uh, both the United States and Europe realize that they have a difficulty harvesting their fruit and vegetables and having the food that they need without having the migrant laborers that they have come to depend on. Um, Germany and Norway have uh, chartered special flights from Romania and other places across otherwise restricted borders in order to bring migrant laborers. Um, Germany has talked about changing the status of refugees so that they can work more quickly in agriculture. 
um, and other uh, France and the UK have started programs to encourage citizens to work on farms. In terms of health, Mexican migrant farm workers have very poor outcomes. To be specific, agricultural workers have an occupational fatality rate, a death rate directly from their work, five times higher than the national average. Migrant and seasonal farm workers have increased rates of many conditions, including injuries, HIV, tuberculosis, heat stroke, malnutrition, insomnia, anxiety, sterility, liver and kidney disease. But despite such poor health status, migrant farm workers have very poor access to healthcare in the United States. It's estimated that only 5% have health insurance. And although there's a federally funded migrant health program with migrant clinics, it's estimated that this program serves roughly 13 one three percent of the intended population. And despite the increased occupational injury rate, farm workers are excluded from healthcare benefits in workers' compensation in most states in the US. And finally, some research indicates that indigenous Mexican migrants have significantly lower rates of health insurance than their mestizo Mexican counterparts. This transnational project um, involved multi-sided fieldwork accompanying indigenous treaty migrants from the Mexican state of Oaxaca in the south of Mexico. The fieldwork began in Washington state and involved five months living in a labor camp, picking strawberries twice a week, accompanying migrant workers to clinics, hospitals, and social service institutions, and interviewing farm employees, migrant health physicians, and nurses. I then accompanied several Triki extended families as they migrated and spent three months in Central California, living first homeless out of our cars and a city park, and then in a three bedroom slum apartment with 19 people looking for work, occasionally pruning vineyards, and again accompanying migrant laborers to clinics and interviewing farm workers, farm contractors, physicians, and nurses. Next, I spent four months in the Triqui home village of San Miguel in the mountains of Oaxaca, Mexico, in the partially constructed house of one of the families I knew in Washington state and lived with in Central California. I helped in the house construction um, as money was being sent by family members in the US and in harvesting and planting corn, as well as observed interactions in the village's small clinic. In April of that year, I accompanied 10 young men from this village as they ventured to a border town, made contact with a coyote, a border crossing guide, and crossed the border into Arizona on foot, were apprehended by the border patrol and put into border patrol jail. After my companions were deported back to Mexico and I was released from jail, I interviewed border patrol officers, border activists, and civilian vigilantes in Arizona, before returning to Central California to meet up with my Triki companions who had recrossed the border. And then I accompanied them for another season of berry picking in Washington state. And I've continued to return to each of these sites um, each year since writing this book. I'll talk a little bit about where the research is going next. The rest of the talk will take place in the Skagit Valley of Washington state halfway between Seattle, Washington and Vancouver, Canada. The Tanaka farm is the largest farm in the Skagit Valley, employing 500 people in the peak of picking season from June through October. The farm advertises itself as, quote, a family business spanning four generations with over 85 years experience in the small fruit industry. On a practical level, employees on the farm grow, harvest, process, and sell berries, supporting the explicit goals of the company. On another level, the structure of farm work inheres a subtle and complex hierarchy. The structure of labor is both determined by the asymmetries in society at large, specifically those organized around racialization, citizenship, gender, and class, and it reinforces those larger inequalities. The structure of farm labor includes several hundred workers who occupy many positions 
from owner to receptionist, field manager to tractor driver, berry checker to berry picker. And anxieties, privileges, and health differ from the top to the bottom of this labor organization. I'll run quickly through this social structure on the farm, starting with the executives and moving through to the pickers. The third generation of Japanese American Tanaka brothers makes up the majority of the executives on the farm. The others are Anglo American professionals recruited from other businesses. The executives work seated behind desks in private offices and live in their own houses, many with panoramic views of the valley. They work long hours, usually starting before the sun comes up. They often take time off during the day to work out at a local gym or meet friends to eat. And they worry about farm survival in a landscape of competition and economic globalization. The crop managers have private offices in a small field house several miles into the fields from the main farm office, though they spend significant time walking and overseeing what goes on in the fields. They work similar hours to the executives and have somewhat less choice in when they take breaks, roughly dependent on whether their bosses are around or not. They're all Anglo-Americans and live in private houses in one of the nearby towns. The administrative assistants work seated at desks in common spaces and live in relatively simple family houses near the farm. They're almost entirely white with a few US citizen Latinas who come from Texas each summer. The teenage checkers, local Anglo high school students, weigh the berries and spend much of their time waiting. Both the administrative assistants and the teenage checkers worry primarily about the moods and reactions of their supervisors. The other workers live in one of the labor camps. The first holds 50 people and is located 100 feet from the road. Each shack here has heating and insulation and the field supervisors who walk outside observing and directing the pickers live here. Some treat their workers with respect while others use outright racist epithets. They're bilingual in Spanish and English, almost entirely Latinx US citizens from Texas, along with one Mistec indigenous man from the Mexican state of Oaxaca. The other camp located several miles away from farm headquarters holds 250 people. The shacks here have no heating and no insulation. This is where the majority of the farm's laborers, strawberry pickers who are paid per pound live. They're made up almost entirely of undocumented treaty indigenous Mexicans. Marcelina, a 28 year old treaty picker explained, it's very difficult for a person here. I came to make money. Like I thought here on the other side of the border, there's money, but no. Sometimes the checkers steal pounds Sometimes rotten berries make it into the bucket. Eat that one, they say, throwing it into your face. They don't work well. This is not good. There in Oaxaca, we don't have work. There are no jobs there. Only the men work sometimes. But since there are many children in my family, the men don't make money for me and my son. That's why I wanted to come here to make money, but no. In many ways, at Ethnicity, education, citizenship, I didn't take the appropriate position in the labor hierarchy. For the purposes of my fieldwork, I positioned myself in the housing and occupations of the treaty undocumented immigrants. I picked twice a week and gained bodily data such as knee, back, and hip pain for days afterward. I often felt sick to my stomach the night before picking due to stress about reaching the minimum weight. Because of my social and cultural capital, the farm executives treated me as someone out of place, giving me special permission to keep my job and my labor camp shack, even though I was never able to pick the minimum weight. Crop managers and supervisors treated me as a sort of jester, a form of respected entertainment. They often joked with me using rhetorical questions like, are you still glad you chose to pick? and they picked into my bucket to keep me from falling too far behind. On the other hand, the other pickers interacted with me with a mixture of respect and suspicion. Many wondered why there was a gabacho chacan, which in Triki and Spanish means bald-headed white American, 
who was picking berries with them. Several people believed I was a spy for the police, the border patrol, or the US government, while others argued that I must be a drug smuggler looking for a good cover to hide from the police, the border patrol, or the US government. During dinner one evening in his labor camp shack, Samuel, who's the man standing up with the Nets hat on, told me about the problems that the lack of resources created in his hometown and said that they need a strong mayor. I asked if he would be mayor someday and clearly understanding social hierarchy, he replied, no, you need to have education and money and ideas. You'll be mayor of San Miguel set and you can do a lot of good. We need a water pump and paved roads. Near the end of my research, Samuel told me, right now, we and you are the same, we're poor, but later you'll be rich and live in a luxury house, a casa de lujo. I explained that I didn't want a luxury house, but rather a simple house. And I was honestly thinking about a craftsman house in Berkeley or in Seattle near where I went to school. Samuel clarified his social analysis, but you'll have a bathroom on the inside, right? This ethnicity and citizenship hierarchy not only produces the labor and housing pecking order that I described, but this whole complex maps onto the health inequalities outlined at the beginning of the talk. The tricky people inhabit the bottom rung of the hierarchy in the Skagit Valley with the most stressful, humiliating, and physically strenuous jobs with the most exposure to weather and pesticides. They live in the coldest, wettest shacks in the most hidden labor camp. In a recent essay on obesity, literary scholar Lauren Berlant develops a theory she calls slow death. Exploring temporality, suffering, and agency within contemporary forms of capitalism, she defines slow death as, quote, the physical wearing out of a population or deterioration of people in that population that is very nearly a defining condition of their experience and historical existence. In a different place, she describes slow death as, quote, the embodiment towards death as a way of life. Berlant describes the ordinary and taken for granted attrition of life, agency, and the human subject in the context of neoliberal racialized capitalist exploitation. She argues that slow death is not memorable and not capable of causing meaningful change because it is experienced as, quote, crisis ordinariness, unquote. Therefore, it is uh, a defining characteristic of normal life for particular categories of people. In some ways, indigenous Mexican farm workers experience an everyday ongoing life akin to the slow death described by Berlant. Migrant farm workers suffer myriad health problems due to the conditions in which they live and work, including chronic pesticide and heat exposure, repeated carrying of heavy loads, and regular work with dangerous machinery, protracted harvesting while bent over or kneeling. But it would be equally fair to mention that the chronic conditions causing migrant farm worker injury include the re-regulation of the state in support of the market. <clears throat> For example, the North American Free Trade Agreement, disallowing poor countries from protecting their citizens with tariffs while allowing wealthy countries to protect their products with inverse tariffs we call subsidies, as well as the chronic condition of structural racism and anti-immigrant prejudice and policies that effectively bar certain classes of people from specific jobs and funnel undocumented Mexican immigrants into some of the most dangerous and unhealthy positions in society. Farm work is defined by the temporality and spatiality of slow death. Strawberry pickers on the farm in Washington state are required to bring in a minimum of 550 pounds of de-leafed strawberries every hour. Otherwise, they're fired and kicked out of the labor camp. In order to meet this requirement, they take few or no breaks from before sunrise until the afternoon when that field is completed. Many do not eat or drink anything before work, so they don't have to take time to use the porta potty. 
the toilet. They work as hard and fast as they can, picking bent over at the waist, seven days a week, rain or shine, without a day off until the last strawberry is processed. They leave their families and homelands to hike through a mortally dangerous desert in order to survive. Yet these times and spaces of slow death are largely invisibilized while politicians ignore immigrant workers <clears throat> in the midst of ongoing debates of health reform. Because of the contemporary racialized, classed, and illegalized definitions of the categories Mexican, <coughs> migrant, and farm worker, the chronic wearing out due to these labor and living conditions is deemed normal for even essential to those persons positioned in these social categories. For Mexican migrant farm workers, in some ways, death is meted out over time and space. After my first week on the farm, one young female picker told me that she could no longer feel anything in her body at all. Another said that her knees, back, and hips are, quote, always hurting. One of the young men I saw playing basketball before the harvest started told me that he and his friends could no longer play because their bodies hurt too much. And Abelino, a tricky father of four who lived near me in the labor camp, explained, you pick with both hands at once, bent over, kneeling like this, and he demonstrated kneeling all the way down. Your back hurts, you get knee pains and pain here, and he touched his hip. When it rains, you get pretty mad, but you have to keep picking. They don't give lunch breaks. You have to work every day like that to make anything. You suffer a lot in work. During my field re research, some of my family and friends came to visit me and they blamed the farm executives alone for the living and working conditions of berry pickers. They assumed that it was the growers fault that the pickers live in such poor conditions and that the growers alone could easily rectify the situation. Here's an aerial view of the Skagit Valley leading up to the beginning of my research that demonstrates two things we know are going on in the US and globally. First, expanding urban boundaries. During my research, some of the farmland um, was bought up by Walmart and Costco. And second, you can see that smaller family farms are being bought up by larger and by definition more and more corporate farms. The hierarchy on the farm is not entirely conscious or willed on the part of farm owners as individuals. <clears throat> the inequalities are also driven by structural violence as well as the anxieties it produces. The stark market competition and precarious future on the farm squeezes growers such that they worry about the potential bankruptcy of the farm as well as their family's own quality of life. The structural nature of the labor hierarchy comes into relief when the hopes and values of the growers are considered. The Tanaka farm executives are ethical people who have a vision of a good society that includes family farming. They want to treat their workers well and leave a legacy for their children. Several of them asked for my opinions on how the labor camps could be improved for workers. Perhaps instead of blaming them as individuals, it's more appropriate to understand them as human beings trying to lead ethical yet comfortable lives in the midst of social, political, and economic hierarchies. So now that we've considered the ethnicity citizenship hierarchy and the ways in which it produces injury on the farm, I'd like to move on to consider the practice of migrant health before concluding. First, I'll consider the migrant clinic in general before moving on to the illness narratives of two tricky migrant laborers. Medical professionals in the field of migrant health work under difficult circumstances with unreliable sources of funding. They often feel hopeless as they watch the health of their migrant patients systematically decline. Dr. Samuelson, a physician in the migrant clinic in the Skagit Valley explains to me, I see an awful lot of people wearing out 40 something or late 30s or early 50s. They're just worn out. They've been used and abused and worked physically harder than anybody should be expected to work for that number of years. They come out with a nagging back pain. You work it up and it's not getting better. 
and you don't think they're cheating the system, it gets to the point where you have to give them a CAT scan and their back is toast. In their early 40s, they have the arthritis of a 70 year old and they're not getting better. They're told, sorry, go back to what you're doing and they're stuck. They're screwed in a word and it's tragic, unquote. At the same time that most health professionals in this field feel overworked and powerless to change the structural forces causing health problems for their patients, <clears throat> they also felt a commitment to work with this population. Many voiced the feeling that Mexican migrant farm workers deserved top quality health care, and most described a sense of calling to care for this group. Abelino, the tricky father of four who lived near me in the labor camp, experienced acute pain in his right knee when he pivoted from one row to the other while picking strawberries. After continuing his work in vain hopes that the pain would go away, he told his field supervisor about the incident. The boss said simply, okay, and drove away. Unsure of what to do, Abelino kept picking in great pain. Two days later, work was abruptly canceled and Abelino and I went into an urgent care clinic. Abelino ended up seeing four doctors and a physical therapist, usually without a translator in Spanish, much less in Triqui. And in the intervening months, he limped around camp taking care of his kids while his wife picked in the fields. <clears throat> the urgent care doctor explained that Abelino should not work. He should rest and let his knee recover. The occupational health doctor we saw the following week said Abelino could work, providing he didn't bend, walk, or stand. Abelino went to the farm office to ask for lighter work of this sort, and the bilingual receptionist told him in a frustrated tone, no, porque no, and would not let him talk with anyone else. <clears throat> After a few weeks, the occupational health doctor passed Abelino's care to a busy rehabilitation medicine physician who told Abelino and me that he must work hard picking strawberries in order to make his knee better. She asked me to translate that he had been picking incorrectly and hurt his knee because he didn't know how to bend over. But notably in her rush, she had not asked Abelino any details about his work, including how he bent over. And years later, Abelino still tells me that he has occasional knee pain and that the doctors don't know anything. Los médicos no saben nada. Crescencio, another tricky man living near my labor camp shack, approached me after picking <clears throat> one day and asked if I had any medicine for headaches. He explained that every time a supervisor calls him names on the job, makes fun of him or reprimands him unfairly, he gets an excruciating headache in the center of his head. He told me that the headaches made him prone to anger with his wife and children. And he told me that he did not ever want to become violent with his family and wanted help for his headache before that could happen. He had seen a few physicians about it in Mexico and the US, as well as a traditional tricky healer, but nothing had helped long term. The only thing that made his headache go away was drinking 20 to 24 beers, and then he would wake up without a headache. He told me that he had to use this remedy a few times in a given week. And I suggested that he go into the local migrant clinic to see if they could try something new for his problem. <clears throat> a week later, he told me that he had seen one of the doctors in the clinic, but that, quote, she didn't know anything. Later, I interviewed this physician about the interaction. She was trained in one of the top medical schools in the US and chose to work in this clinic because she wanted to ameliorate the suffering of marginalized populations. Relations. She was smart, idealistic, and hardworking in the midst of a busy, understaffed, and underfunded clinic. After looking at her notes in his medical chart, she explained, well, yes, he thinks that he's the victim and thinks that the alcohol or the headache makes him beat his wife. But really, he's the perpetrator and everyone else is the victim. Until he owns his problem, he can't really change. Nothing really works none of these migraine medicines or anything, but put people in jail because then they see a show of force. That's the only thing that works because then they have to own the problem as theirs and they start to change. He came to see me once and I told him to come back two weeks later after not drinking. 
but he didn't come back two weeks later. Instead, he came back a month later. It looks like he told the doctor he saw that time something about when people at work tell him what to do, it makes him angry and that's what gives him a headache. <clears throat> he needs to learn how to deal with authority. We referred him to therapy. Do you know if he's going to therapy? Unquote. Despite this physician's idealism and good intentions, her busy, difficult job and her education did not allow her to see the social context of the injury of her patients. In the birth of the clinic, Michel Foucault describes the theory of the clinical gaze. He explains that there was a change in clinical medicine around the time of the advent of cadaveric dissection or what we call anatomy lab. Whereas physicians used to focus on the words of the patient, the sy symptoms as expressed by the patient, they began instead to focus on the diseased organs, treating the patient more as a series of objects making up a body. In Foucault's description, the primary question changed from, quote, what is wrong to, quote, where does it hurt? This change was necessary for the birth of positivist science and contemporary forms of scientific knowledge. And as would be expected within this paradigm, the rehabilitation doctor and the migrant health doctor described earlier saw the tricky bodies in their offices yet were unable to engage the human and social context leading to their sicknesses. <clears throat> Thus, it was unavoidable that they would utilize a narrow lens that decontextualizes sickness, transporting it from the realm of power and politics to the realm of the individual body. Yet since the time of Foucault, the paradigm of biopsychosocial health has been taken up in medicine. Beyond the acontextual gaze theorized by Foucault, physicians today are also taught to see behavioral factors in health, such as exercise, diet, and substance use. Behavioral health education has been added as part of the laudable move to broaden health education. However, without being trained to consider the social structures that shape the suffering of their patients, health professionals are equipped to see only biological and behavioral determinants of sickness. Thus, well-meaning clinicians are limited to blaming the sickness on the patient. For example, the assumed incorrect bend while picking or the supposed trouble with authority <coughs> without appreciating the hierarchies that position their patients in particular risk scapes in the first place. Ironically, the progressive move to include behavioral health in medical education without the correlate inclusion of social analysis may be exactly that which leads clinicians to individualize risk and responsibility, inadvertently blaming the recipients of socially structured injury. So how has this order of inequalities become unchallenged and unquestioned? How has it come to be understood as normal and natural? And when is it resisted? Pierre Bourdieu explains a theory of symbolic violence as the naturalization, including internalization of social asymmetries. He explains that we perceive the social world through, quote, historically accreted schemata of perception, unquote, that are issued forth from that very world. These cognitive schema then reflect the social structures to which we've become accustomed. Thus, we misrecognize the social order as natural because that which we are perceiving matches the lenses through which we're perceiving it. The inequalities comprising the social world are thus made invisible, taken for granted, or normal for all involved. When I asked a Mestiza Mexican social worker <clears throat> why tricky people have only berry picking jobs, she explained, a los Oaxaqueños les gusta trabajar agachados. Oaxacans like to work bent over. Whereas she told me mestizo Mexicans, called simply Mexicanos, get too many pains if they work in the fields. Later, I asked the farm's apple crop manager why I hadn't seen any tricky people harvesting apples, <clears throat> the field job with the highest pay. And he explained, Oaxacans are too short to reach the apples. They're too slow. They have to use ladders a lot more than some of the other guys. And besides, they don't like ladders anyway. 
He continued that Oaxacans are perfect for picking berries, quote, because they're lower to the ground, unquote. The same thing a California state senator said in a hearing about migrant farm labor in the US. These perceptions of bodily difference along ethno-racial lines serve as the lenses through which symbolic violence is enacted. In this way, each category of body is understood to deserve its relative social position. Because of what is perceived to be their natural characteristics, indigenous Mexican bodies are understood to belong picking berries as opposed to other jobs. On the other hand, mestizo Mexicans and white Americans are understood to have bodies that do not fit well in the picker category and belong in other positions. I'm gonna skip part of a consideration of pesticides so we have more time for discussion at the end. Um, at the same time, it must be highlighted that Abelino and Crescencio continued to demand care and the potential for living a fully livable life. As I write about further in the book, they also participate in collective action, organizing and demanding healthier working conditions on the farm. Many of these actions were then limited by the functioning of the law in the US and the ways in which the power hierarchy functioned with the farm. In certain ways, the indigenous Mexican migrant body is understood to betray itself specifically because of perceptions and metaphors of ethno-racial difference. <clears throat> the migrant body is seen as belonging in its position in the very transnational agricultural labor hierarchy that then leads to its injury. The structural violence inherent to segregated labor on the farm is so effectively erased precisely because its disappearance takes place at the level of the body and is thus like the body understood to be natural. In conclusion, attention to what's hidden in transnational agriculture reveals segregations of laboring people and bodies by perceived ethno-racialization and citizenship into hierarchies that in turn produce correlated injury. Such inequalities are effectively naturalized through the symbolic violence enacted by perceived bodily differences. In addition, migrant health professionals tend not to see the labor hierarchy nor its production of sickness and injury through their clinical gaze. Instead, they often blame patients for their suffering and recommend interventions inadvertently complicit with the social hierarchy. The structural nature of these inequalities is illuminated by the fact that even idealistic and ethical farmers and clinicians operate within gray zones that neutralize and sometimes reverse their efforts at moral action. If we as social scientists <clears throat> and rural sociologists are to orient our work toward contemporary problems and the potential for positive social change, we must denaturalize social inequalities, uncovering linkages between structural violence, symbolic violence, and slow death. In this way, the schema of perception, as well as the social and political structures they reinforce can be transformed. In addition, the academic project of denaturalizing social and health inequities can inform pragmatic activist and policy efforts at many levels of a micro to macro continuum, from including pickers in farm English classes to including the social determination of health in medical education, from buying the products of farms that treat workers fairly to the lobbying of politicians to change unrealistic and violent immigration policies, and finally to activist and policy work for a more equitable global market such that people may be free to, but are not forced to leave their homes to migrate in the first place. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Seth, for this great talk. Well, um, 
in which you introduced us to the lives of uh, of migrant uh, migrant workers and the structural nature of uh, of injury but also for your hopeful words uh, at the end the floor is now open for questions and comments please use the q and a um, tap on your screen to ask your question or raise your hand I have a question from Niaz Nuri. Um, maybe I should read it first. Can everyone see the Q&A? Well, everyone can oh. see it, but you can, you can read it and, and directly okay. respond. And meanwhile, if other, other people have questions, please um, set them in the, in the Q&A or raise your hand. Go so, ahead. So um, this, this is from Niaz Nuri. How, how do, um, how did Turks see the migrant Kurdish workers in particular and the Kurds in general in the past, let's say since the mid 1950s, didn't they believe that the Kurds were terrorists and um, listen only to the sheikhs? Uh, briefly, the roots, roots of Kurdish image from the perspective of the Turks um, or elsewhere uh, in I am interested in these. Um, thank you. Okay. So there is not a lot of anthropological research like the ones that I and Seth did um, in the 50s or starting from the 50s. But um, Kurdish migration, especially in agriculture, has been going on since actually the mid 19th century. But it was pretty much limited to this agriculture, earliest agricultural hub of um, Turkey, which is Chukurova, the capitalist agriculture, that's what I mean, and like large scale monoculture. So that's what calls a lot of migrant workers. Um, but the, the Kurds became the majority of the labor force after the forced displacements in the 90s, after um, the uh, after the, the region was dispossessed by war, both uh, urban poor and the um, rural people who lost their means of production in the war. So we don't have a lot of information about how Turkish employers interacted with their Kurdish workers until um, basically like 2000s. Right. So, but we know that there were many um, farm workers. There are um, novels by um, Yashar Kemal, for example, who talks about um, the migrant workers' predicament. Um, the earliest research, sociological um, or social science research that I could find on the areas like um, Chukurova, which resembles mine in, in ways that they did conduct field work, um, were from the late 80s and 90s. And in those um, the in in those research um, books or the um, we, we what we see is the gradual but increasing militarization of the the monitoring and regulation of uh, this labor practice. Namely, um, so they, the state tried to start regulating um, the, the migration and labor of these workers, but also the ways in which um, they were structurally involved were, for example, through wage setting commissions. As more and more uh, Kurdish workers got involved in this labor practice, um, police forces or military commanders started to sit in on committees setting those wages or um, started to intervene in uh, conflicts between Turkish um, farmers and Kurdish workers more and more. That's what we know from earlier research. Thank you, Denise. 
meanwhile, ah, there is another question in the chat um, for uh, also for for Denise. Um, so several hi Johnson. <laughs> um, several questions for me. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Thank you for being here. Uh, the first curiosity of mine is about gender issues and intersectionalities. You highlighted that gender is another focus. So um, you mentioned other racialized dimensions in general. How I, however, I'm still wondering as a female researcher, how did you immerse yourself into the research setting? What kind of challenges have you faced to reach women participants or to communicate with male participants. Also, how do you think that gender and age dynamics play a role in uh, race making while having affective and embodied experiences in the farms? If you shed light on these issues a little bit, that would be appreciated. Um, so again, like with, as the majority of this migrant labor force became Kurds, the, um, the, individual worker was no longer really the labor unit. Uh, Yildiza Tosoy also talks about this um, transformation, I mean, not transformation, but what he she observes in um, Anka in a farm in Ankara, I think, or the central Anatolia somewhere. So the family is the labor unit. They're hired as families. They are um, housed as families the labor tasks or the labor process is generally um, based on families. And that is, I think, one of the most interesting parts of this um, labor practice, because we don't think of the collective nature of uh, labor power, generally. We think of capitalism as, um, you know, distinguished from earlier modes of production by its individualization of the uh, of the worker, right, and the replaceability of one worker uh, with the other. So the family, as the labor unit, does a few things. One is one the Kurdish migrant family becomes a hub of um, gendered and socially racialized um, subjectivities. Um, the Second one, it's completely dependent on the reproductive and productive labor of women in making children into full, fully, or and el the elderly into fully functioning or the, uh, the, 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 a wage worker that would equal the physical capacity of, um, of an adult worker. So the, the labor that women are supposed to do, well, one is a double shift after a 12 hour shift. Um, they have to give the children a shower, they have to wash the clothes, they have to cook dinner. Um, but also this makes them that it, it, that makes them it's their labor indispensable or at least only transferable to another woman in the family in a very uh, similar position. So the mother can be trans, you know, uh, exchanged not with like just any other laborer, but with a sister or sister-in-law very close in the household. So that I think is one of the most interesting features of uh, how um, the family becomes a hub of um, gendered and racialized subjectivities. How I accessed is another question. So I had political connections uh, in Kurdistan through um, my pro-Kurdish um, activism, I can say. Um, so I have been involved in these networks since uh, my undergrad years and I had made several connections and knew the, and I had good references. When I decided to settle, so I, I went around a little bit in Kurdistan before I settled in Derek 
And I figured out it would be easiest for me to settle in a, you know, 20,000 population town rather than a much larger one like Kuzultepe or um, Viranshayr, for example, which are over 100,000 people. Because I had, I found it more manageable to let, figure out how these towns um, have their own social dynamics. It wasn't as too close to the border, so it wasn't the the agenda was not completely hijacked by the Syrian war, um, but it was close enough, forty miles to border, uh, so that it was feeling the effects of violence both across the border and later on in um, in the uh, in the town itself as the the um, but. Yeah, as war in Kurdistan restarted. But my initial access was through several things. One, I had conducted research in Western Turkey since 2008, before settling in uh, Kurdistan in 2014. So I had um, some farmers refer to me, refer me to former workers. In, in Derik, I had previously worked with another farmer family and that was another um, point of access. And um, then I also like met people through uh, activism, uh, both like rural, um, rural development networks and um, Kurdish activism. What helped me um, in this process as a, a woman was mostly that I, I was very lucky. I found myself among a very supporter, supportive um, group of women uh, who, and a lot of farm workers are women, right? The, I would say the majority are women and children because they they don't have the same access to the urban uh, labor force as single women or like as single men do, like in tourism and construction in other sectors that are prevalent in urban sectors. So this, Labor practice is done mainly by um, women and as families. So since I was also within families, I didn't. I was not perceived as a threat. Um, as Seth said, yeah, jester, spy. Um, you know the or, the um, also like comrades sometimes were, um, but also you know, entertainer were my um, general, uh, can I say, like roles that I adopted. But I, I was seen as a sister. I was taken in by a family um, and stayed in one of the working class neighborhoods, not like in the apartment buildings. Um, and that, so, and also I was the only Turkish woman in the, in the town uh, who was neither married to a man from Derek nor was a, a state employee. So I was, you know, I had like 20,000 people talking about me within a month probably. <laughs> so who wanted to meet me. Um, yeah, so these were like how the answers to your access question. Okay, thank you very much. Denise, uh, Mark, he has a question for Seth, but both have turned off their camera. Mark is back. Um, Seth, are you back too? Seth had a minor emergency, so he left for a moment and apparently... That's okay. Well, there's, there's a few questions for Denise in the uh, Q&A, so we yes. can continue with those. Yeah. Two questions for Denise, and one question, uh, Denise, is uh, how did you construct your estimate about the numbers of uh, of migrants, among them the uh, the Kurdish migrants, and um, um, the relation between Kurdish and Turkish farm workers? But maybe if yeah, Seth is back, Mark, are you still there? If Mark is there, we first start with the question for Seth, and then later we come back to you, Denise. <laughs> Thanks, yes. Yeah, thanks both for really fascinating presentations. Um, I was just wondering, for, for Seth, um, we hear a lot about this narrative of robotics and, and 
digitalization of, of farm work. I'm wondering uh, if you come across that narrative in your field work for a farm owners talking about robotics, um, or is this a bit of a, an overstated narrative? Um, and also, are there any, or what do you see as potential effects of perhaps a, a robotics future on the lives of, of farm workers? Good question. Um, so there are three things that come to mind with the question of robotics and machines in farm work. One relates to migrant farm workers experiencing being treated as machines or robots whose labor is important, but whose body and lives and personhood um, is not. And that came out, um, I've, I've heard that in my research and probably, I don't know if Denise has for years. Um, and especially during COVID, it came out, you know, you governments are saying that my labor is essential, but you're not giving me personal protective equipment. You're not changing labor conditions so that I and my family um, are safe. Sorry, Can, I'll come right back. Okay, <laughs> we have a, a short break in the uh, in the answer of the of the question. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, meanwhile, uh, Denise, you could answer the questions by uh, Ulash and by uh, by Rob on the estimate of the number of workers and how you know that the uh, majority are Kurdish workers and the relation between Kurdish and non-Kurdish or Turkish uh, workers. So Rob, as I said earlier, there, the statistics um, on these issues are really unreliable. So I'm um, basing my estimation on completely um, anecdotal evidence and what I have observed in the field since 2015. I also conducted um, field work in 2016 in the summer, but I haven't been back um, since then, back to the field, I mean. Uh, so may the the number of Syrian workers might have at this point exceeded um, Kurdish workers. But what I assume um, is one, there are several um, impediments to making the the inclusion of Syrian workers in this um, labor force. And that therefore like limits their, they try to work the entire time, but um, there are many labor hierarchies and new um, domination um, systems, I can say, that emerge with the entering of this, the Syrians into this labor force. One of them is, for example, um, pairing, um, Syrian workers with workers from Turkey based on their common language and making one family a chaperone of the other, um, which brings with it a lot of abusive relationships and um, as you can imagine, different labor hier hierarchies and uh, schemes of domination. So it made Syrian workers come in and out of this labor force a lot. So the continuous um, standing relationships of Kurds for the last 30 decades, since Kurds keep being dispossessed with war, um, they, in, they continually um, come into this migrant labor force uh, and the many generations have been doing it. So Kurds, still like have those working relationships through labor intermediaries mainly. Um, so that's like one reason why I think Kurds would still be the majority. The second one, although when I went back in 2016, I was told the entire money supply is now Syrian workers, um, which could also like give you an idea about it. Yeah. Oh, the second reason, um, and I'll keep it very brief, 
after 2015, 2016, the, when war restarted and after the uh, coup attempt, um, I know that a lot of families who did not used to be farm workers had to go into farm labor. Okay, thank you, uh, Denise. Then we return back to Seth. You look a bit out of breath, Seth, but maybe uh, <laughs> if you take a deep yeah. breath, you can uh, start uh, or continue your answer to the question of Mark. Sure. So the other two things, the first is that feeling like you're treated like a machine because your labor matters, like your function for the capitalist system and for the food of people, but your life and your body don't matter. Um, and there's, you know, for farm workers, they point out many clear examples of evidence of that. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is on the farm where I worked, uh, one of the farms where I did field work, um, there were machines that were starting to be used. Um, and ironically, um, without any plan to do so by the farm owners, so different uh, crops, blueberries, strawberries, apples, cherries were sold to different companies. And they're often not labeled by the farm that they come from. They're labeled by the company that makes the jam or whatever. Um, and one of the companies that was buying berries from the farm is an organic label that's a big organic label in the US that makes cereals and jams and all kinds of things. And somehow in the negotiations between the organic label and the farm, the um, fields that were going to go to the organic label, therefore not having any pesticides, were decided to be picked by machines. Whereas the fields that had pesticides in them were picked by human hands without gloves. And the fields that were next to where all the farm workers lived in labor camps were sprayed by pesticides. Um, and this was not any farm owner saying we should make people be extra intoxicated by pesticides and we should, it was, but it was each individual field had different contracts with different labels. And in this process without meaning to, the irony is that the farm workers human beings were exposed the most to pesticides and the machines were not. Um, and then the other thing that comes to mind is last year, um, the vice president of the United Farm Workers in the United States, I think the largest union of farm, migrant farm workers and Alistair Isles, who's an environmental scholar on kind of ag alternatives in agriculture, um, organized a meeting about kind of technological futures of agriculture and what that means for the future of labor also and for human beings who depend on jobs. And um, I think it's an open question what will happen. What we know pretty clearly right now from COVID in the last year is that countries, societies can't feed themselves right now the way our racialized, capitalist, transna unequally transnational food systems function without precarious, often racialized um, labor from other places, other countries. Part of the, this little emergency thing that happened is, um, and I'll, put it, I'll try to put it in the chat somewhere or in the q and I'll figure it out. Um, there's a, a big lawsuit against a company called uh, Terra Fecundis, which related to some of the work that I did in California with um, farm labor contractors who uh, are paid a certain amount per field and then pay under minimum wage to the workers. But the farm, it's hard for the, it's more complicated to hold the farm accountable because they don't have records of each individual picker. They just have records of the contractor also related in a way to what Denise was talking about with the labor intermediaries, um, who in certain ways are helpful for having jobs in other ways also are a form of institutional invisibilization of relations and responsibility. Um, 
Terra Fecundis is being uh, tried in Marseille like today and tomorrow and Friday um, for hundreds of counts of human rights abuses and breaking labor laws at the same time that none, zero of the French farm owners who use Terra Fecundis to hire labor are being tried. Um, so I'll, I'll try to put, uh, I don't, I think I only have information in Spanish or French, so I don't know what's most helpful. I'll, maybe I'll try to find a link to both and put it in the chat while Denise. Yes, okay, thanks, uh, thanks Seth. So we were live in a lawsuit uh, event. Um, we are almost at the end of the after seminar, but I have I have one one question actually for uh, for both of, of you, and that's the about your perceived uh, closeness to nature, which uh, legitimizes farm hierarchies. And you said a few words on that, uh, Seth, but maybe you can explain it a little bit uh, more, and then uh, maybe. Uh, after that, uh, Denise, you can also say a few words about that. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have much time, so I also ask you to be brief um, as well, as far as that is possible uh, uh, with the question I have asked. Let's go ahead, Seth. Could you restate it really quickly? Well, the perceived closeness to nature as a le legitimation for uh, farm hierarchies. Hey, you mentioned it. Um, but maybe you could you could say a few more more words about it. Yeah, I mean, there's so many levels on which that's important. There's a book that came out a few years ago by Mel Chen called Animacies, um, where they analyze the ways in which different their their um, degrees of animateness animacy ascribed to different humans based through racialization and the most animate, modern, thoughtful, conscious um, get the most protection and value and priority and the people assumed to be less animate, less modern, less thoughtful, less conscious are um, considered closer to non-human animals. And then, and Mel Chen analyzes all the way to rocks and couches and things. Um, and um, but how, how, how does that came back in your research? Because you, you, you mentioned it, uh, you, you said, well, some of the, uh, of the, of the farm workers, they're, they're closer to the ground, uh, uh, have a, na a naturalization of, uh, of, 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 well, of uh, farm hierarchies and farm yeah. work division. Yeah. There are a few ways that it happened in, happens in this context in relation to the US and Mexico. One is um, <clears throat> more of a continuum between what ha people who are considered backward or savage or uncivilized and people who are considered civilized and modern and the ways in which those metaphors do or legitimize e extreme forms of both physical violence, legal violence, bureaucratic violence, structural infrastructural violence. Um, uh, actually, just you talking about um, the supply chain makes me think of a recent article about infrastructural violence that I'm still thinking about and whether that's a more helpful way to think about what's going on than structural violence. But, um, but that's the, the metaphors, the narratives of legitimation happened more on that continuum than specifically on closer to nature. What was happening in the moment of their lower to the ground, I think, think was more a um, justification both of malnutrition unthinkingly um, through generations, but also um, a racialized justification of labor. Well, if they're shorter, it hurts them less to pick, so therefore they should pick. Not taking into account histories of colonialization, um, displacement from land, and the related malnutrition from that. Um, and not taking into account whether or not they actually have pain, um, not asking any questions about it. So I'm okay, interested. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Denise, will you be able to add? Uh, yeah, I have words a, briefly on just a issue? few words. Um, the observation of the dirt and the shit and the sexuality of the other, just like Seth said, leads to animalization 
or like other metaphors of monstrosity, savagery, and it, in my field work also um, makes, legitimizes violence and um, exploitation and domination. What one of, I had a, um, an instance of um, that, like a very striking instance of that, like which illustrates for me this point um, was that like there were two agricultural engineers uh, one of them, a woman, and we met outside the farm uh, when one of them discovered me in, on the fields. And he introduced me to the woman engineer as, look, she's one of those um, farm workers that um, the, the labor intermediary he, he cited um, brings. And, said, and she said, um, so like she said, he said, I, I, I thought you were one of the workers friends who, who maybe needs is in need, whose parents are in need and like goes to the university or so. Um, so he was like minutely observing my um, body too in that um, field. But she said, having never encountered me before, I would have recognized you from your smell. So Although I, I has, have been staying in the same um, farms, right? In the same, and like, it's very hard to distinguish um, people based on um, phenotype or racial appearance um, between Turks and Kurds. And she said, like, despite me being staying on that farm, um, having no access to water, having no ex or like very limited access to water, using the same um, bathroom facilities, working 12 hours under the sun, I would still smell like roses, whereas Kurds um, who have been doing this for whatever reason would smell up the fields and that's her words. So I think that the sensory information also is a huge part of what people observe and making race. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, well, we, we came to the end of this uh, of this seminar or webinar, a two hour webinar. So uh, thanks a lot for all the diehards who stayed with us during the two hours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Denise and Seth for your uh, for your presentations. I'm looking forward to read and hear more from uh, from you. Um, thank you, Mark and Lisette, for making the seminar technically possible. And, uh, well, I hope to see uh, everyone back at uh, the next uh, RSO seminar. Uh, announcement will be posted on our Facebook and blog. So I wish all of you a good, I don't know, evening, uh, a remainder of the morning or afternoon. And uh, see you next uh, time.